Friends, welcome to our continued studies in Revelation on the 28th of October. We continue our studies in Revelation chapter 12. We are thinking about the introduction to the fourth scene. We looked at two of the um, sections last week and we look at the final two, the, the first of which is the, the much longer of the two and then just a, a, a fleeting glance at the last verse which is uh, the last section of these four. And then God willing next week we'll come to begin to look at some of the seven visions in this scene themselves. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for the glory of who you are. We bless you for the way you have revealed yourself in the scriptures. And in those pages, how we are able to picture something of your glory. We think of Moses falling on his face before you as the bush in front of him was burning but not burnt up. Or Isaiah sensing his own unworthiness when he saw that vision of you in the temple and your robe filling all things. Lord, we bless you for Peter, James and John and how they saw the Lord himself transfigured on the mountain. And in this revelation given to John, he too falling on his face as if dead until you spoke and raised him up to his feet again. Lord, help us to have reverent hearts. Help us to understand your word more fully, that we might appreciate all the more the greatness of your name. Lord, hear our prayer and bless us as we think on these things today. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Friends, we find our reading in Revelation 12 at verse 7. We looked at the first um, six verses of chapter 12 and the last verse of chapter 11 last week. And so we read on and we read of uh, two further sections in this introduction to these seven visions in scene 4. At verse 7 we read, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. Who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torment. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commands and hold to the testimony 
of Jesus. Ending at the end of chapter 12. Friends, in last uh, uh, study last time, we began to look at the opening of this scene four. We looked at the first two of four sections. We looked at the symbols. We saw firstly that heaven doesn't speak in this instance of where God dwells, but rather uh, the unseen world where God's glory is, but also there's that, there's that tension because of the devil and his demons. It's a place of spiritual reality. But within that, then we have the second symbol, that of the temple. And the temple speaks of where God is. Now, of course, God is everywhere. And we learned last week that his glory fills the whole earth. So God's glory is revealed everywhere. There is no place where he is not. And no place where his glory will not be revealed. And then the last thing we looked at was the ark. And the ark spoke of God's covenant relationship with his people. How he was going to save his people from their sins through the redeemer that he had promised. So we began last week with those three symbols. Then we went on to look at three characters. The first was the dragon, which we saw to represent Satan himself. The second was the woman. Not representing Eve alone or or representing all uh, women in that godly line down to the birth of Christ. But speaking of all of God's people, the faithful Old Testament remnant. And also the church born of the spirit uh, through the, the resurrection, the power of Jesus, the sending of the spirit into God's world. And then there's the child, the Lord Jesus himself, the promised Messiah who would bear the sins of his people. Now we come to sections three and four in this opening introduction to scene four. And uh, the third section is simply the plot. Uh, And then we look at the prelude, which is simply a verse at the end and a very brief thought on that. So the section three is the main thrust of our study today. So what is the plot? We read of that in verses seven to 16 of chapter 12. Now, as we do this, we have to keep remembering or trying to remember what has gone before, because Revelation is a series of pictures And they're interrelated. And so uh, pictures uh, impinge on others. And um, unless we can do that, we can't really grapple with what Revelation is saying to us. So what is pictured in verse 6, which is the verse we ended at last time, the end of the three and a half years in the desert. That is practically the end of history. Because after that um, symbolic three and a half years, there's the three and a half days where the church appears to have its witness extinguished before the final coming of Christ. So this is at the very end or almost at the very end of history. So when we come to verses seven uh, following, um, what we're actually seeing is it's a repetition, but with a slightly different focus. I suppose it's a bit like looking at a, at a, at a sculpture head on and then going to the side and looking at, at it and, and, and seeing the different shapes pronounced that weren't pronounced um, with, with a head on view of whatever that sculpture was. It's that type of a thing. We we, we turn around a little bit and we look again. We are warned that these verses following in the text, verses 7 to 16, 
don't follow an historical sequence. So at the end of verse 6, we're not looking for something historically to follow on. Because there's a lot in these verses for three and a half days. And of course, that's a symbolic number anyway. When we come to verse 14, the events we have there become or seem so similar to those in verse 6. So verse 6 was what we ended with last time. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for a hundred, uh, 1,260 days. And then in verse 14, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she'd be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. So we have this parallel teaching. God repeats himself, and, and we find that uh, in the scriptures continuously, uh, that God gives us a truth, then he either highlights it in some ways or interprets it in some ways or just simply goes back and uh, re-emphasizes what he has already said. Um, verse 14 is a parallel with verse 6. And when we see that, then we see that the rest of the section is to be seen in parallel. It's not a historical following on. So we begin by reminding ourselves of what happened in verses 1 to 6, because verses 7 following is just another, as it were, turning that round and looking at it from another angle. So the child was the Lord Jesus Christ. The woman, Israel from whom he was to come, uh, born of Mary, uh, but not only the Israel, the faithful remnant of the Old Testament, but also the church of the new, which is born of the Spirit. Because we read there of the, the child's ascension, you know, being caught up, um, his, his victory complete, he returns to the glory. And then after that, we see that the woman is protected still, the church, um, Israel before Christ, the church after Christ, God keeps his Old Testament faithful. He keeps his New Testament faithful. And then there's the dragon. The dragon who seeks to destroy the child. When he fails, he turns his anger against the church. He goes after the woman. He goes after she who represents the people of God. So now we begin at verse 7. And we see how this is repeated with just slightly different emphases. But it's like looking at something from two angles and just getting a, a fuller picture. So we piece it together. Verse 7, we come to uh, Michael for the first time. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. We know that when Satan rebelled against God, he corrupted angels who became demons. And so there was that battle in the heavenly places between Michael and the angels and the devil and his demons. Now, Michael is recorded in Daniel chapter 10. So in our, in our attempt at being consistent in our interpretation of Revelation, we uh, continually look back rather than trying to look forward. Uh, it's a mistake to try to look at the world round about us and then try to fit Revelation into it. Because that's just like saying that ours is the it generation. Ours is the generation where these things are being fulfilled. But of course, when our generation passes and if the so-called interpretations have not come to pass, then it's a false prophecy. Rather, revelation is given for God's people of all generations. 
and we look back into the Old Testament to see how it relates and teaches us about what we see in Revelation. So Daniel chapter 10, at the end of that chapter, um, uh, at verse 21, but first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. In other words, God is speaking of the archangel Michael and his loyalty and faithfulness to God. He is the champion of Israel. So we come to Michael for the first time in Revelation. Then at verse 9, we come to the dragon. And he's mentioned there as the, the ancient serpent. Now, why ancient? When things are ancient, we tend to think of them being decrepit or past their best. Um, not so here, because ancient means the first created. Satan was the first created being. He was beautiful. He was powerful, full of wisdom, full of truth and knowledge. Um, and as such, he now becomes the, the epitome of, of wickedness and cunningness and ability to deceive. So he is our greatest adversary because of his being ancient being created first. We see the opposition in verse 7, similar to that at the end of verse 4. Uh, uh, maybe just looking back um, at that in verse 7, his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. The end of verse 4. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. We see here just uh, two different verses speaking of that same event. We have this repetition, the attack of the devil against the people of God. And of course, from that people, God was going to bring his redeemer, his messiah. The conflict between the two archangels, um, Michael and, and Lucifer, who became Satan, paralleled in the conflict between Eve and the ancient serpent, the serpent in Genesis, and between Eve's offspring and uh, the serpent's offspring, really between Christ and the devil himself. And when we look back into Paul's letter to the Galatians, if you have a Bible and want to look back into Galatians 3 at verse 16, we find here this uh, very clearly defined for us. Galatians 3, firstly at verse 16, and then chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians 3, 16, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. And then in verse chapter 4, verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. So there's this picture of the battle between Eve and her offspring, a singular offspring, the one who would be the Messiah, the one who would deal with the devil. So then the child is born, and his triumphant progress is mentioned in these first six verses in chapter 12, uh, from his birth uh, in Bethlehem through to his victory on the cross, his ascension into glory. Now he is unscathed by the dragon because even in death, Jesus chose to die. So that in itself wasn't even a victory. It was all in the plan of God. 
and the devil's plotting in every point came to nothing. Then in verse 10, moving on from verse 7, 8 and 9, and into verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Now the people of the new Israel, that's the church, they're able to claim this victory over the dragon because of the lamb's death. And that's where um, this section is naturally leading us. The devil is defeated. And then who are those who are then able to claim that victory? It's the people of God. And so we have a, uh, this scene uh, or the section before our, 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 our scene really opens um, Reminding us of what these visions, these seven visions are all about. It's about God's covenant in saving his people. In God keeping his people safe. Of the absolute defeat of the devil. And the power of God being revealed. And from verse 10 we move now into verse 11. Even the death of a Christian, the death of the body, is not something that a child of God should fear. And that's a glorious revelation here in verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. See, that's the Christian's victory, isn't it? It's not by our ability. It's not by our belief. It's not by our strength of character. It's not even by the change God can make in a person's life. Our victory is because of the blood of the Lamb. Because Jesus died and rose again for me. That's the heart of faith. And because he so loved me to give his life for me, that I now have my life in him and that life cannot end. So verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, declaring what God has done for them. That's the testimony, not what I have done, but what God has done for me in Christ. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. In other words, death doesn't have hold on a child of God. Then in verse 14, we have this um, picture. The woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she'd be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. She's brought them, God has brought a people to himself on eagle's wings. Now we find this picture back in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 19 and at verse 4. It's the time of the Exodus. And God is reminding his people from Mount Sinai of how he has delivered them, how he has taken care of them, and how he will take care of them. And in verse 4, chapter 19, in Exodus, we read, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. They are safe in the desert. The people of God in the days of Moses, in the Exodus, were safe in the desert. The picture of God carrying them out of Egypt out of the land of bondage, uh, on their way to the promised land and in the desert before they would enter the promised land, 
God would continue to be their protector. Even though for most of that time they proved faithless rather than faithful. Isn't that the picture that God gives to us? Not only of Israel but of his church. He saves us from bondage to sin through the sacrifice of Christ. He carries us to himself. And in the desert, this world in which we live, he keeps us safe. Even though at times we're rebellious, he holds us tight until the time when he will bring us finally to our resting place in heaven, the promised land. God's people are safe in this world. They are safe in the desert. And the other metaphor we have here is that of the flood, which speaks of the power of Egypt. We looked at this in Ezekiel's prophecies last time. But we come to uh, a, a very simple and clear uh, reflection back in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 15 at verse 12. And we uh, find this mirrored here. In Revelation chapter 12. So it's Exodus 15 at verse 12. Moses is singing his song to God before the Israelites. You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. Now we have that picture here in Revelation. The sense of the pursuing army. Uh, those going to attack God's people, they were swallowed up by the water. We find the same thing here in Revelation, chapter 12, verses 15 and 16. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torment. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. That same picture, the dragon tries to overpower the church, Satan, to defeat the church of Christ. But God allows that, that torrent of, of, of water, that picture there, to be just the earth opens up and the water disappears and God's people are safe. In scene four, we will come to the seven visions beginning next time, God willing. We'll find that they're oddly static. We could imagine that visions of cosmic conflict would be quite graphic and fast moving, but they're Strangely, quite static. And the conflict they describe is not a sequence of events. We've learned this already in Revelation. But rather it's the story of a battle that is ongoing. It's ongoing through all the generations. That's why everyone who reads this book can receive a blessing because this book applies to them. Not just to a certain generation. They portray truths for all of us in every generation. We'll come to a beast. We'll come to another beast. We'll come to the Lamb's followers. We'll come to a trio of angels. And then we'll come to three other visions making up the seven. And in those three visions, the last three, John points particularly to the future, as he does with the last seals and the last trumpets of scenes, or, yes, scenes two and three. Scene four follows on this similar pattern. But before we come to that, uh, I trust next time, we finish with the prelude, which is really brief. It's simply the last verse of chapter 12. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey, who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So what is the, the prelude 
as it were, just before the, the curtain opens and we begin to see the first of these seven visions of cosmic conflict? Well, it's because of the victory of the child who is Christ over the dragon who is the devil. That the devil then comes, the dragon comes to visit his anger on the woman and her offspring. The church, the faithful, God's people of all generations. Before Christ it was the Israel of God, now it is the church of Jesus Christ. And the dragon mobilizes his forces and the resulting conflict. Well, that's the subject of the next seven visions we will see. It is the battle for God's people in all generations. And we look to that, God willing, next time. Let's pray together. Father, we bless you for your word. We rejoice in its completeness. We rejoice in a book like no other books, from Genesis to Revelation. The way you reveal with consistency, with enlightenment, all that we need to know, that we might be godly on earth, and longing for the glory. How we rejoice in the pictures we have seen in Revelation. How you guard your church, represented by the, the lamps in the, in the first scene. How you take care of your church amidst all her suffering as the seals are opened in scene two. How in grace and mercy you warn the world as each trumpet is sounded. And just before we come to look at scene four and these visions, to be reminded of your, your covenant purposes. You are the God who reigns over all things, the God in the temple. You're the one who has victory in all the spiritual realities unseen. You're the God of the Ark of the Covenant. And you promise salvation in Christ to your people. We bless you for the child, the son that you have given. We rejoice in the defeat of the devil, that ancient serpent. We give you thanks that as the woman, the church of Jesus Christ and the Old Testament faithful as well, that you keep your children safe in every generation. That picture of carrying them on eagles' wings to yourself and giving each a safe place in the desert this world. Lord, we give you thanks and we pray that you'll help us to understand more fully as we come to study some more next time. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Look forward to your company next week.